Welcome. I am Dr. Burton Wright, the command historian for the U.S. Army Chemical School and the historian for the Army Chemical Corps. It is my pleasure to welcome you to a tour of the Army Chemical Corps Museum. Behind me is the Earl J. Atkinson Building, the Army Chemical Corps Museum. This is a Chemical Corps' pride and joy, for within it are contained the history of the 79 years of life of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. Over the time of this program, I, Mr. T.K. Miller, the museum curator, and retired Sergeant Major George Murray, the Command Sergeant Major of the Chemical Corps Regiment, will take you through the museum and show you in detail, up close and personal, the history of this fine branch. We are now in the U.S. Army Chemical Corps Museum. This is the Chemical Corps Regimental Room. One of the displays within this room are displays of unit crests of Chemical Corps units, past and present. Each crest, you see here, lists the unit crest, its name, and its combat lineage. Eventually, all the units that have ever existed in the U.S. Army Chemical Corps will be displayed on these walls. This part of the museum is dedicated to showing visitors history of chemicals and plants from 1100 B.C. to 600 B.C., ranging from Samson to the Spartans at Plataea. Between 660 and 1200 A.D., Greek fire was used by the Byzantines to repulse attacks on Constantinople. The composition and use of Greek fire were state secrets, and to this day, historians are unable to agree on either. In 1592, Korea's Admiral Sun invented what is called the turtle ship. The dragon mouse spewed smoke and flame. The smoke provided cover for the advancing armada, and the flame was used at close range against enemy ships. History has a beginning. The Chemical Corps' beginning was in 1917, but the use of chemicals in biological systems in war far predate that. This statue is an example. It is a statue of a soldier of the Caliph of Baghdad throwing a naphtha-filled ceramic pot to flame on the walls of an enemy city. In 1701, Charles XII used smoke to hide the crossing of a river during his campaign into Russia. In 1797, Napoleon Bonaparte used swamp fever in an attempt to infect the inhabitants of the city of Mantua uh, in order to gain their surrender. The father of modern chemical warfare is considered the Earl of Dundonnell, this gentleman here. He was the individual that first saw the uses of chemicals from watching miners work in the sulfur mines of Sicily. In 1846, he proposed a new type of shell that would uh, use gas as a method of attacking a position. That shell was considered by the British government, but was never adopted for one obvious reason. The delivery system, the shell itself, this, the technology did not exist then to make one. These type of shells were considered for the Crimean War in 1855 and for the American Civil War in 1864. This display shows a letter written by a Mr. Forrest Shepard of New Haven, Connecticut to President Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Mr. Shepard proposed in a diagram enclosed with a letter uh, shells that would be chemical in nature that would saturate the Confederates with chlorine gas in fixed or fortified positions. This would keep Union casualties low and lead to Union victory. The shell was never adopted. In the latter part of the 19th century, the use of chemical weapons had become so common that international conventions had to be called to deal with them. In the year 1874 in Brussels, a conference was held which prohibited the use of lethal chemicals. In 1899 in The Hague, a similar convention was held, signed by 26 countries, prohibiting the use of chemicals that were either lethal or asphyxiating. During that time, from 1874 to 1906, the only part of the United States government that was at all familiar with any type of lethal chemicals was the Bureau of Mines, headed by Van H. Manning. Uh -huh. 
This is the entrance to the World War I exhibit area, dedicated to the memory of the 1st Gas Regiment and all soldiers who fought in World War I. Within the Chemical Corps Regimental Room, there is a special place of honor reserved for the 1st Gas Regiment. This regiment served the nation and the state from 1917 to 1919. To my right is a replica of the 1st Gas Regiment Memorial Rock, which is located in the Memorial Gardens outside this building. The blue flag represents the flag of the 1st Gas Regiment. The red flag represents the flag of the 30th Engineer Regiment Gas and Flame. This was a prototype unit. This was a unit from which the Chemical Corps traces its lineage and honors. This flag is the original flag borne by the U.S. Army's 1st Gas Regiment, the Hellfire Boards, what they commonly referred to as gassers. These men were the prototype chemical soldiers that protected the American Expeditionary Force in World War I. This display highlights the first gas attack in April of 1915 when the Germans used chlorine gas against two French divisions. This inaugurated large-scale chemical warfare in World War I. During World War I, the United States began a campaign to obtain different types of pits, such as peach pits, corrosion nuts, or coconut shells. These were burned and used as charcoal for gas mask fillers as filter elements. This display recognizes and honors the 30th Engineer Regiment Gas and Flame. Formed in August 1917, this was a prototype chemical regiment that the Army created for its American Expeditionary Force. This unit formed at Camp American University in Washington and trained there for deployment to Europe. This painting, entitled Gas Attack, 1918, was commissioned by the Chemical Corps Regimental Association to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. It was painted by Mrs. Joy Beeson of Huntsville, Alabama. This display honors the 1st Gas Regiment from 1917 to 1919. Within the display can be found a portrait of its first and only commanding officer, Colonel Earl J. Atkinson, portraits of all the companies that made up the regiment in that time, and a reproduction of the famous tree trunk, which can be seen on the symbols of the flag of the 1st Gas Regiment and of the current Chemical Corps. The four-inch Stokes mortar was developed by Captain Stokes of the British Army in World War I. It was designed to be fired from an angle of about 45 degrees. Range was regulated by a variation in the propelling charge and a vertical elevation screw. The mortar is loaded and fired by dropping a complete round into the muzzle. The entire weight of the mortar is 105 pounds. This display honors the training by the British 1st Special Brigade of the American 1st Gas Regiment when it arrived overseas in World War I. This is a display of the Leibniz Projector M1. The Leibniz Projector fires a 66-pound round at ranges from 910 to 1,450 yards. The weapon is fired in batteries of 25 projectors dug in at angles of 45 degrees for maximum range. This weapon was developed by Captain Leibniz of the British Army in 1915. This is an example of life in the trenches in World War I, an often dark and forbidding place. Soldiers who remember it well said that it was like hell with the fire out. This is a display of a soldier sleeping in the trenches in World War I with his mask in the ready position. This is a display of a cylinder attack in 1916. From 1915 to 1916, gas cloud attacks, of which cylinders were the principal part, were common on the Western Front. This is a display of horse mass used during World War I. The primary mode of transportation was the horse, which had to be protected in gas attacks. This is a display of the various chemical alarms used in World War I. They range from a hand crank siren all the way to a hand rattle and even flags and bells. During World War I, pigeons were often a form of communication between units in the trenches. To protect pigeons from possible chemical attack, the Chemical Warfare Service provided pigeon gas protector boxes to keep the birds from harm. This is a display 
of gas masks used in World War I, ranging from the first gas mask in 1915 to masks in 1917, 1918 that were considerably more sophisticated. Masks were used and supplied to troops of all the participants in World War I, but some masks were better than others. On 11 June 1917, General John J. Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force in France, created an independent gas service within the AEF to centralize preparations for American troops to fight in a toxic environment. I'm Command Sergeant Major George Murray, working the uh, museum, Chemical Corps Museum, to take tour groups through to show uh, to explain the exhibits of the Chemical Corps history. The item we have here right now is a M10 spray tank used to spray chemicals, uh, either smoke or chemical agents, uh, to contaminate an area or to screen an area. Uh, this particular tank, you carry four of them on a fighter aircraft, two on each side of the, uh, under the wings, and they are wired up with a detonator in the front and the detonator in the back, and when the pilot is ready to make smoke, he will just simply throw the switch and blow the glass out, and the air coming in the tank will uh, pull the liquid smoke out and make a smoke screen to cover the area. On the wall leading into the World War II exhibits, we have pictures of the early chiefs of the Chemical Corps at the time called the Chemical Warfare Service. General Seibert was the first, uh, we refer to him as the first chief, actually he was the first director of the Chemical Warfare Service uh, into, in World War I. At the 1920 National Defense Act, creating the Chemical Warfare Service, General Freeze was appointed the first chief of the Chemical Warfare Service and held that job for nine years, until 1929, uh, really building up the Chemical Corps. The World War II era will show the exhibits and the displays give the history of the Chemical Corps in World War II. It went from a very small technical service and expanded tremendously in World War II with many, many new developments. This exhibit was to show the uh, industries that supported the Chemical Warfare Service in World War II, uh, manufactured chemical agents, uh, munitions and weapons, and also it locates some of the newer inst installations that were developed in World War II, such as Dugway Proving Ground in Utah, Rocky Mountain Arsenal in uh, Colorado, Pine Bluff Arsenal in Arkansas, and many other plants that uh, provided support for the uh, war effort. This is an exhibit to show the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, at 7.55 hours on a Sunday. Uh, the Japanese attack really triggered the entrance of the United States into World War II. The colored cords here show the approaches the Japanese planes used to bomb Pearl Harbor. They not only bombed Pearl Harbor, they attacked Hickam and Wheeler Field and Schofield Barracks and other outlying areas. We had at Schofield the 8th Company 1st Separate Chemical Battalion, of which I was a member. We also had a chemical company at Hickam Field and Wheeler Field. Earlier, Dr. Wright showed you the exhibit in World War I of the four-inch Stokes mortar that was used, developed by the British. We took that four-inch Stokes mortar and, after many years of experiment, made a 4.2 chemical mortar, which at the time was the only rifle mortar in the world. We went from a short range of about 1,400 yards with the four-inch Stokes mortar and increased the range to 2,400 yards with the 4.2. And this is what the troops received when the, when the weapon was standardized. It was on a cart about 540 pounds. It took four men to pull it on flat ground, two men on chains up front, two men on the handles in the back. 1942, they came out with a great invention, a Jeep, and they gave us a Jeep and trailer for the mortar and a Jeep and trailer for the ammunition cart. In the middle of World War II, we improved this mortar again and made the M2 mortar out of it and ended up during the war firing out a range of 4,450 yards. This display shows the 4.2 mortars from uh, the first one on the left is the M1, which had a range of 2,400 yards. Uh, the mortar on the right, uh, with an increase in better powder and so on, we had a range of 4,400 yards. And you can see the difference if you look at the base of the second one, the M2 mortar, is the reason we were able to get such a, a long range. The mortar in the middle was the development during the war, and it's a recoilless 4.2, and we never actually saw any service.
one of the problems we had was the limited traverse of the mortar from right or left, which was about 120 mils. So work was started developing a 4.2 mortar with a 360 degree traverse so you could fire in any direction without having to replace, re-emplace the mortar every time you wanted to fire it. We have two versions here. One on the left is the Marine Corps version, the one on the right is an Army version, and they were never fully developed uh, in this uh, particular model. One of the many problems we have is protection of the soldier in the field. And one of the items we developed to protect the soldier was a protective cover, as you see right here on this mannequin. And the protective cover looked like this when it's carried in a gas mask carrier of each soldier. And if there were an event of a spray attack from aircraft, as you see in the picture here, the soldier would take this out and unwrap it like a package of gum and throw the cover away, and you have this thing exposed. You get two red tabs, you spin around and get air under the hood, and you put it over your head. And then after you get this on to protect you against spray attack, then you would put your gas mask on. One of the other projects we worked on was protection of non-combatants. Uh, we had a particular problem with children. Uh, an adult gas mask would not fit them. So with the concurrence of Walt Disney, we developed the uh, Mickey Mouse mask. Uh, this is apparently the only one left in existence. Uh, we manufactured about 50,000 of these and sent most of them to Europe. Uh, this is the only one in, that we can find in existence, and everybody wants a copy of it. We have pictures here of Walt Disney with General Porter and some other officers uh, upon the development of this mask. Uh, additional non-combatant, we did some work on children. Uh, this is an infant protector, and it expands out quite a bit. You could put a pretty good-sized child in here, and it protects the child against chemical agents. Uh, for children that had a respiratory problem, and small infants, we had another model where the parent or someone could stand next to it with a bellows and pump fresh air into the protector so it wouldn't have any problem with the breathing. Uh, this is a display of the gas masks used by the U.S. Army, uh, those that we entered the war years with and those that we developed during the war. Uh, an attempt was made on the development of new masks to get rid of the can heavy canister and the hoses, and we succeeded in doing that in tremendous strides when we developed the assault gas mask or the M5 mask this mask was developed for assault operations, beach operations, and so on, and it was used by the troops landing in Normandy on D-Day. Uh, some of these are specialized masks, as the M1 optical mask was made basically for the Navy uh, to be used on instruments such as range finders and uh, other optical instruments. Uh, but the others are all Army except the British assault gas mask they developed in World War II. We have down low uh, part of the display uh, animal uh, gas masks such as dogs, horses, uh, pigeons, and so on. The bag over there is the U.S. development of a bag to protect pigeons, and it has a bellows in there that the uh, handler would pump fresh air into the bag for the birds. Birds were an extremely important uh, communication uh, item uh, early on. All right, here we have some protection of animal protection, horses. On, on my left here, we have a horse gas mask, a German manufacturer, World War II. Uh, this particular item was sent to us by a Navy officer's uh, wife. Uh, he picked it up in Normandy uh, right after D-Day, and it's hard for me to believe that any horse is going to stand still to have those two items stuck in his nostrils so that he could breathe. On the right, we have the American mask that we used, uh, or developed rather, up, up to World War II. Development of horse gas masks stopped after World War II because of the mechanized uh, army we had. Also, we have on the wall some protection for their legs, uh, and hoofs, uh, leggings, and so on, to protect them against mustard gas or contaminated area. A decontamination is the removal or neutralizing of a toxic chemical agent on the ground or on a piece of equipment. Uh, the technique hasn't changed much over the many years. Uh, some of the substances used in decontamination has a little bit. Uh, basically, we start out with chloride of lime or bleach or HDB, whatever you want to refer to it. Uh, and we had for a portable job a small apparatus called the M1 spray apparatus, a uh, man carry on his back. You put chloride lime in here, mix it with water, and you get a slurry, and you can spray it as you see in the picture. Uh, anybody that has a rose garden or a flower bed has one of these probably in his uh, shed. Another method is to mix it with dirt, or sawdust, or sand, or something to spread it, and that way you don't get a white cover like you would with the spray in here. Chloride lime comes in these containers of this size, and you can mix it uh, any way you want it. 
uh, for weapons, trucks, tanks, and so on. We had another substance called DANC, D-A-N-C, which stands for Decontaminating Agent Non-Corrosive. And we used it in this particular piece of equipment, the M2 decon apparatus. Every vehicle, artillery piece, and so on had one of these with it. Looks like a fire extinguisher. It was made by a fire extinguisher company. You had to be careful with DANC. It says decontamination agent non-corrosive. If you use it on a weapon, you had to be clean the weapon afterwards and oil it because it would make a, a uh, weapon corrode. This is the M2 mine filling apparatus for use in the field. It fills a one gallon landmine of World War II vintage. You see the mines below the uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, it's a t just a one gallon paint can is what it is really. Uh, it's a very simple operation. You pull the arm up, and the round body you see fills up with a liquid agent. When the mine is in position, you pull the arm down, and one gallon goes into the mine. You remove it from the stand and cap it, and that's about as simple as it can be. Uh, this is a 400-gallon power-driven decontaminating apparatus uh, mounted on the chassis of a two-and-a-half-ton GMC truck. It's used in decontaminating large areas or buildings and other equipment. This is the M3A1 model of decontaminating apparatus. Uh, early version, you see it's a wooden tank. Uh, other models later on during the war had a steel tank. Uh, you would put 225 pounds of chloride lime in this and fill it up with water to 400 gallon capacity. Uh, when you were ready to decontaminate or spray as we talk about it, you would run the hoses down each side of the uh, walkway and an operator would ride on each fender on the side. When you're ready to go uh, to spray, the driver then would turn on the power-driven apparatus and agitator in the tank would stir it up, keep the chloride lime in suspension so that you would have an even covering of the chloride lime on the, on the ground. Uh, early into the war, some bright individual decided this could have another purpose in life. So they made a shower unit out of it by drilling holes in the rails along the side. Uh, you can't see them from here but it was a very popular unit in the field, people wanting showers. Uh, cold weather, we had an oil heater on a trailer behind it, we'd drag it along and you could have warm water or hot water in the wintertime. Here we have some graphic training aids, uh, posters used during World War II to impress the importance of chemical warfare on a soldier. Uh, we try to tell them about the importance of taking care of his gas mask, also to teach a soldier what a chemical agent smelled like. About every chemical agent we had had a distinct odor. So we try to point that out to them on these posters. For example, forging gas smelled like fresh cut corn, new mown hay, a very distinct odor. But we had a problem when we got a kid from New York City or Chicago and he didn't know what that odor was. So we developed many means of trying to impress the soldiers how to detect these things. Here we have some smoke munitions and smoke equipment used in World War II. Smoke, very important in the war to camouflage or uh, cover operations uh, from airfields to harbors. Uh, river crossings, amphibious assault. Here we have a, a number of hand and rifle grenades used by the uh, Army to, uh, f for small screens and for other purposes. We have larger smoke pots here. This one is for use on land, uh, and they'll burn for about 20 minutes. The other is the floating smoke pots using amphibious operations uh, that they would burn for 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the model, and produce a large white cloud. Uh, use them to cover a beach, uh, especially in river crossings in Europe. This is the first really portable smoke generator we had, the M2, and with a 55-gallon drum of fog oil, this thing could make either a smoke cloud or smoke haze to camouflage an area or cover an operation uh, in the field. They were not designed not primarily for uh, in the combat zone, but we found out early on they were necessary and chemical units then took on that mission. Uh, this is the M33 airplane spray tank, called Smoke Tank, one of the largest ones we had in World War II. Uh, this one was primarily used for spraying toxic chemicals to contaminate areas. Uh, two of them would fit in the bomb bay of a B-17, and four of them would fit in the bomb bay of a B-24. And they were used for high altitude spraying, not down uh, low on the ground like your M-10 spray tank making smoke. You could also put this... Uh, under the wing of a fighter aircraft, if that aircraft could carry a 2,000-pound bomb. It works on the same principle as the M-10. You had detonators and glass plates in here, and the detonators would blow everything out, and the air coming through would pull out the chemical agent. 
Prior to World War II, uh, detection of chemical agents by smell. Uh, we had no equipment to do that with. Uh, however, as we got into the war, they came out with many items to uh, help the soldier detect and identify chemical agents. Uh, the first one uh, is a can of paint you see on the left. Uh, this paint, with OD color, would be painted on the hood of a truck or a tank or anywhere you wanted. And if the mustard or lewisite gas hit that OD paint, the paint would turn red. And the paper next to it is the same thing. The paint is on heavy-duty paper. Uh, next to that is a crayon, which is a pink crayon. Uh, you could use it any way you wanted. And when the chemical agent hit the pink crayon, it would turn blue. Uh, as the war progressed, we came out with the M9 chemical detector kit, and it would identify just about any chemical agent we used during World War II or the enemy would have used uh, instead of just the mustard or lewisite. So they had detector tubes for various chemical agents and reagents and so on, and a pump to take samples of the air. So it was a big, big improvement uh, in the few years that we were in the World War II. The Chemical Corps, Chemical Warfare Service, rather, didn't do much experiment with flame between the wars, as they were not impressed much with the flame work in World War I. However, they did some work, and by 1941, we ended up with the M1 flamethrower here, M1 portable flamethrower. Uh, it weighs about 65 pounds full, carries five gallons of fuel, which basically was gasoline with a little bit of oil. And with what is light fuel, gasoline and oil, you would have a range of about 20 yards. Uh, which meant you had to get pretty close to your target. Uh, with heavy fuel, which is napalm, and we have a can of napalm here, it's a, a soap product, uh, you mix with gasoline and it doubles your range to 40 yards with the, the heavy fuel. I had a problem with this uh, flame floor because of the ignition system to ignite the fuel. In the tropics and heavy humidity, it, it had problems with ignition if it, if it got wet. It had a spark plug in it. So to improve on things, we developed the M2 flamethrower, <clears throat> which we ended the war with. Uh, it's a better flamethrower, about the same weight and same characteristic, except it has a better gun. <clears throat> if you can see the difference in the gun there, uh, it has guaranteed ignition. It has a cylinder in it with five incendiary charges that function like a revolver. You pull the trigger, it will ignite one and it will burn about five seconds. Then you want the second ignition, you can pull it again, the next one, it just keep turning. Uh, so you could fire one long burst of 10 seconds, that's how long it lasted, or five short bursts or two short bursts, depending on what your mission is and what you're trying to eliminate. <clears throat> the flamethrower in the middle was an experimental flamethrower. Uh, it's on a cart, and it's more or less what we used to refer to as an emplaced flamethrower. You could dig it in somewhere on a defensive position, and you have a lot of fuel, as you can see, in large tanks. And you could use it in case the enemy attacked in the flame, you could use it in flame warfare. Uh, it was not very practical, and of course our defensive positions in World War II were not such. We kept moving and lived in foxholes, so this thing did not uh, get standardized and get used at all. Uh, for protection of the soldier in the field, additional protection was his uh, impregnated clothing. Uh, we would take whatever the uniform the soldier was wearing in the field and take it to an impregnating company or send it to an impregnating company and they would impregnate this clothing with chemicals. And these chemicals would protect the soldier against chemical agents like mustard or lewisite that fell on them from a spray or artillery. Now, rather than send the unit, the uniform back to a laundry unit or whatever this company was uh, for re-impregnation, uh, as soon as the soldier found out his, he was losing this protection, uh, he would re-impregnate it himself. Now this stuff that they put in a uniform uh, basically had a chlorinate of paraffin to hold it together. And it's a, a terrible feeling when you first put it on. It's real greasy and slimy feeling. Uh, but in heat and exposure to the sun, this would break down. So to tell the soldier whether his protection was leaving him, we had a small detector kit here that we used. Uh, and it has uh, some reagents in it. And they would take this bottle and put a drop under the armpits or in the crotch of a uniform. And this is where the heat and sweat would make it break down quicker. Now, if his test indicated he was losing his protection, he would get this field set so he didn't have to send his uniform 10, 20 miles back to the rear. And taking these chemicals, you have three containers, you mix it in this canvas bag, <clears throat> mix the chemicals in it, take your uniform off and dip it in here. And this amount would take care of about a platoon you had a clothesline to hang your clothes up to dry, a paddle to stir it with, and so on, and you could impregnate your uniform in the field. Of course, this was one problem. Everything you wore got impregnated from your socks to your underwear, 
So if you did it in the field, you better have another uniform on or you're going to get a mighty bad sunburn. Uh, going into World War II, General Baker was the chief of the Chemical Warfare Service. And he retired early in 41, and General Porter assumed that duty in May of 41 and stayed on all through World War II and did a tremendous job in building up the Chemical Warfare Service. At the end of November 45, he retired, and General Alden Waite was the chief that assumed the duties from him. Chief chemical officers normally spent four years in their position. Hello, I'm T.K. Miller, Director and Curator of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps Museum. I'd like to take you on a tour of the Chemical Corps from Korea through Vietnam. We are currently in the process of constructing exhibits depicting the role of the Chemical Corps in Desert Storm. During the Korean War era, the Chemical Corps developed testing kits for water, food, and soil. These kits were developed to detect chemical warfare agents which would pose a serious risk to the health of our soldiers. During this time, they also developed a kit for treating gas casualties. This is the M30 4.2 mortar, which was developed by the Chemical Corps as an improvement to the World War II version. This mortar is capable of firing rounds a full 360 degrees on a swivel base. Previously, the M30 4.2 had to be lifted and turned. This is the M3A1 smoke generator. It used a pulse jet engine and fog oil to produce smoke. It could be easily used on the ground from a dug-in position or from a trailer, a truck, or boat. This generator is preferred over the more cumbersome World War II model. The M8 one-shot portable flamethrower is used to fire a four-second burst of ignited flamethrower fuel. It could, however, be refueled and reloaded. It is essentially a U-shaped tank fitted with a means for ejecting fuel through the nozzle. The range was between 50 and 80 yards. These are white phosphorus and sodium M16 igniters. They were installed in aircraft fuel tanks to be ignited as firebomb. The white phosphorus igniter is used against targets on land and the sodium for targets on water. The chemical core in Vietnam had to adapt to a new kind of war. They produced smoke for obscurants, CS or tear gas to flush the enemy out of his tunnels, defoliates to clear the jungle canopy, and flame to stop his attacks. These are good examples of the Viet Cong's primitive but effective weapons of war, bamboo arrows. The dragon soldiers of the Chemical Corps were sometimes used as tunnel rats. These fearless soldiers would go into the tunnels with only a knife or a pistol to flush out the Viet Cong. With the escalation of the Vietnam War, the Chemical Corps was called upon to develop new methods to flush Charlie from his lair. The M4 riot control disperser, or Mighty Might as it was called, was developed to use powdered CS to contaminate the tunnels. The lasting effect of the CS contaminated the walls of the tunnels, making them unlivable. This portable flamethrower, the LPO-50, was made by the Russians and used by the Viet Cong. This particular flamethrower was recovered in a VC tunnel. These are various types of homemade chemical masks used by the Viet Cong. Most were constructed of materials discarded by American forces, shower curtains, medical gauze, and so forth. The Viet Cong flag was found in a tunnel near Ku Chi during the winter of 1966. These two devices displayed here were officially called personnel detectors, but were better known as people sniffers. The purpose of these detectors, mounted on aircraft or man pack, was to detect concealed personnel by smoke of their campfires or ammonia from their bodies. Around the outside of the museum, we have many displays of different pieces of chemical equipment and weapons. One of the most unusual we have and rare is this M91 rocket launcher designed and built just to fire chemical rockets. It fires 45 rockets a 115 millimeter rocket that currently the Army is working real hard to dispose of. One of the vehicles in our vehicle park is this duck. It's not spelt D-U-C-K, it's spelt 
D-U-W-K. It's an amphibious truck. It's a deuce and a half cargo truck with a, a boat shape around it for amphibious operations. It was used in Normandy and many other amphibious operations to haul supplies or troops to shore when there was no harbor. Well, luckily, when we got this one, we found on the back of this duck about the only M1 mechanical smoke generator in existence. We had no hopes of ever finding one, and that's what you see sticking up back there, the smoke generator. The first one we had that really produced good smoke in World War II. We're now at the entrance to the Chemical Corps Memorial Park. This park was initiated by Colonel Schmidt about 1984, and through his efforts, the park was uh, started to be built up. And after the initial portion was created to honor the first gas regiment, uh, we expanded it to honor all chemical units that want to put a memorial here to their, for their history. The first memorial you see here, you enter the memorial park, is that stone of the first gas regiment. This stone was built and moved to Edgewood Arsenal early in the 20s to honor those died from the first gas regiment in World War I. The stone was moved down here in 1983 when we first started building this memorial park. The first gas regiment when they arrived in France was completely untrained in chemical warfare. So the British Special Brigade, who had been using chemicals for several years, uh, took the first gas regiment under their wing. And we have a memorial here to show this union of two forces uh, in honor of the British connection, as we refer to it. Uh, the memorial walk in the, mem in the park uh, has been set up to where battalions or any unit that wants to put up a memorial in honor of the uh, veterans that died in combat, uh, as can be done. Uh, the memorial you're looking at now is the 2nd Chemical Mortar Battalion, uh, one of the first battalions to get into combat in World War II. The walk has space for eight battalion memorials. Currently, we have about six. At the end of the memorial walk, we have a benzene ring, part of the Chemical Corps insignia. Around the benzene ring, we have memorials to the major wars or operations that chemical soldiers, dragon soldiers, participated in. The first one you come to is World War I on your right. The second is World War II. As you come around the benzene ring, we have the Vietnam Memorial with the names of those that died in Vietnam. Uh, on the next one around is the Korean War. And the last one we just installed is Operation Desert Storm. 